Hi everyone. You've got Stu and Cedar for once on Facebook Live. And a picture of the side of a single super flow hive. This is the frame we harvested a couple of weeks ago and you can see they've torn off all the capping. They've done a great job of repairing all the cells and you can even see nectar glistening as they've been bringing in the nectar from the Melaleuca flowers and creating that beautiful sweet honey. The Melaleuca is an interesting flower. It tends to pulse with the rain and the, the indigenous here call it the rain tree because when it rains it then bursts into flower usually in the autumn and winter. We're not seeing uh, that coming in today because it's suddenly stopped but last night we had some rain so who knows it might start up again. You can see a filling pattern here if you look at the end frame view. That's a typical pattern when they're filling the cells which is a wonderful thing to see. It's not out to the edge and they're all evenly distributed. When you get it patchy with a full cell, empty cell, full cell, empty cell, that's when they're eating some honey away. In this view you can even watch it change throughout the day. So you can get a good idea of what's going in your hive just by looking inside the windows. And I can tell from this hive, that even though we're seeing it filling, that the hive isn't quite full. And we have harvested these two frames. This one's looking a bit empty. In the side window you can see there's not a full amount of honey. But you, you can see them fairly crowded in between, which is what you want to see. Bees like to be packed. It means you're going to have less trouble with pests, um, like the small hive beetle or wax moth or anything like that if they're nice and crowded. And they like it too. Whereas there's some other hives um, along here where, where they're a bit thin on the ground. Well, thin in their hive, I guess. And so then you go, hmm, better keep an eye on this. Why have their numbers dropped? That's all part of the observation that Cedar was talking about. So our father Stu's here today, so if you've got questions for either of us, just yeah. like most beekeepers... We'll have different them. opinions. <laughs> <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's going to be a bit like that. So you can direct a question to either of us. Perhaps you've seen Stu speaking. He's been traveling ar around the world when we were allowed to travel, uh, yeah, speaking at bee clubs, speaking at big events, and you might have seen him abroad. Um, so he's got a wealth of knowledge to offer as well. You could direct a question to either of us or, or just general, and one of us will pick up the question and the other one will probably argue with it. But Let's, let's go. Let's so go. <laughs> put your questions in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. Now, because I haven't seen a whole lot of, of uh, I'm pretty sure that this hive isn't very full. In fact, I know it is, but they are bringing in some honey. What I'm gonna do is just harvest a little bit of honey, which is something you can easily do with the flow, hi flow hive, is just tap a small amount of honey, leave the rest for the bees if you're unsure. I'm so gonna show you another thing you can do though, that it's really, that we always used to do as beekeepers and that's just heft the hive. Now, of course you won't know when you do that for the first time how much it should weigh or anything like that. But I encourage you to do it every time you're down there, just a little lift, feel the weight of it. And after a while, you're gonna really get the hang of what, of um, you'll be your own scale, honey scales. You know, you'll know that it needs um, harvesting just from the weight. And that's what, I mean, in the old days when you didn't have windows, that's what we would do, just lift them and feel the weight. Hmm, it's about ready, and off we go. So it's surprising how us humans can do that, can judge weight, we get used to that. So it's uh, surprising, but the hefting was the way it's always been done when we just had white boxes in the paddock and there wasn't these windows to give you an idea of what's going on. Then just lifting the hive would give you a decent enough idea whether it's worth opening up the hive to, and uh, if the frames are, you know, 70% capped, you'd then take them back for extraction with the centrifuge and so on. And, you know, we do get people saying, why do you need all of this windows? You know, you just heft the hive, you just lift it. But then after we give them a hive, or they, they get a hive and try it, um, they There's go, so much more there. There's so much more. So hefting is just the old way. It gives you another indicator but now yes you can see the end view you can see the side views if you're a beginner we're encouraging you to pull them apart and get to know what these views mean by um pulling apart and seeing what they mean and um and and after a while 
it'll take a glance when you know how they're going and, and whether it's harvest time or not, whether you need to feed them. Yeah. Last week we did an inspection of the flow frames and some brood frames as well. So if you do want to see what they look like on the inside, dial back one video in our Facebook live stream and take a look there. We've also got the beekeeper.org, which is an online training program we've developed with great content from experts around the world. It's also a fundraiser. So have a look at the beekeeper.org if you really want to get a, a uh, fast track to your beekeeping. Now, so how far are you going to insert that? Well, I uh, only want one jar. So let's say there's six or seven of these in a frame, then I only want to go in, in, in about that far because that'll harvest at a frame of honey from, from that, a, a jar of honey from that frame, so. But the, the, you can fill up quite a big jar, as I said, six or seven, sometimes more depending on what the bees do. You'll notice that when cedar twisted that it was pretty easy. This frame's been harvested before, and we generally find second, third, fourth, the ongoing harvests it's easier to crack than that first one where the bees have glued things together. And this method of just inserting a key a little bit at a time helps when you've got a frame that's pretty stiff. You just can, can go in an inch or two, a centimetre or two at a time and keep twisting and then inserting a bit further and, and so on. And it um, makes it a more gentle process and a steady process and it's gentler on your wrist questions in the comments below have we got any coming in Trace? Yeah great everyone happy to see um, father and son which is very nice. <laughs> Do I know which one's which? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <it's mixed> <laughs> no, we might start singing that Cat Stevens well, song. Well we were called <laughs> brothers early on some of those comments from that crazy crowdfunding time oh, yeah, where there was just right. millions right. of comments going on and thousands of emails every day one was was these yeah it was a newspaper article saying these brothers have invented this thing Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Stu, you would have loved that. <laughs> Look, yeah, some great questions coming in. Um, actually, we've got um, someone coming and saying, how long do the flow frames last and how do you need to clean them if you're going to take them off at winter time? That's a, a couple of great questions there. So we've designed them to, to last um, a very long time. However, it's a new product. We're here now six years in and yes, we've got frames for, that, are, that are now more than six years old but we don't know and for the most part our frames are doing great out there that uh, we don't have a flawless record there are some people that have had issues but it's uh, what we want to do is make sure we look after everyone anyone that does have an issue get in contact and, and we'll, we'll look after you and make sure your your frames are, are good to go again so basically um, that's um, what we're trying to achieve and I, we're hoping that they'll last uh, many 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 years and the, the next part was cleaning. Now, yeah. sometimes this trough area needs some cleaning. We're just getting a, a slow flow of honey this morning because we've only opened just a tiny bit of the frame. Um, so we're not expecting a, a big stream of honey. It's going to basically take as long to fill that one jar as it does to take to fill a, you know, a two litre jar because <coughs> honey flows at the same rate. <coughs> so it just, there's <coughs> Excuse me. When you do harvest the whole thing, it just means you're harvesting the whole thing and it's flowing out at that same rate, but a lot more at once. So that, that's going to take 20 minutes. We, so the cleaning, the bees generally clean it themselves. And Cedar was pointing out the side view just before about how once you have harvested, the bees will get in there, repair the cells and get them ready to, to put honey in again, put their nectar in and and, w and so on. So you generally, the only cleaning you may need to do is the trough down at the bottom. So it's worth when you take the plug out of the bottom that, and you're ready to insert the honey tube, you might want to just squat down and look down there and see if it looks nice and clean. And if it's not, then you can take this key and put a thin strip of cloth, maybe damp cloth if you like, and insert it all the way down the honey tube and twist it around a bit, pull it out to clean it. it, it I mean, and you can do that twice if you want. Usually they're clean, but they're not always, I, I guess. But the bees will generally take care of the rest. Gradually it'll get more and more stained from their use. Um, but that's because the bees are covering everything with a fine layer of wax. 
and that wax gets darker and darker. And um, we found it's it's not easy to clean all that wax off. Actually, it's um, it's uh, I, I've played around with bleach and a high pressure sprayer and so on. You still you do clean it up, but um, that fine layer of wax will tend to stay there, which it, in a way is lovely. The whole every piece of the plastic is covered with wax, even though the plastic's high quality, food grade, BPA free, the best stuff we can get. It's, um, it's lovely that somehow the bees are still covering it all with a very fine layer of wax. Fantastic. Great answer there. Look, we've got um, John in uh, New South Wales, not sure which part, here in Australia. They've harvested two frames of honey and thinking they sh so they've, and they're just wondering, should they leave two for the bees or could they harvest another two frames? Yeah, yeah. It's always the thing. And um, maybe there's big demands on their honey at home. Who knows? It's, it is delicious honey. Um, the, the reason, we encourage you to join up with local bee clubs, with local beekeepers, because local knowledge is best. We don't know, as you said, where John's living, and even if we did know exactly where you lived, it'd be local people would say, no, I know you, you do have another nectar flow coming on in, um, in, you know, early winter or whatever, and they say, you should be safe to take it, or they'll say, no, don't don't take any right now because you're going to have a dearth, what beekeepers call a dearth, that is no nectar coming in now for four or five months before the spring. So always ask your locals and then it's going to be your knowledge too because while the locals understand what's been happening year after year with the blossoms and the flowers in their area, everything's shifting now with climate change which has often been a disaster for beekeepers. Flowering that we, you could have relied on to be early spring, year after year after year, suddenly isn't anymore and overlaps with others flowering. All sorts of crazy things are happening. So these days, you have, and particularly if you're amateur and your, your harvest isn't absolutely essential, you err on the safe side and leave a bit more honey. But consult your locals is the main, the main answer to that. Great, Stu. We've just got Randy's coming in, just wondering what time it is here. And Randy, it's about quarter past ten here in Australia. In the morning. In the morning, just yes. In case you it might be night time. <laughs> uh, Tiz is asking, um, they've got, they must have a couple of hives, but one's weaker than the other, and they've done an inspection and noticed there's not very much brood. Just wondering, should they replace the queen or wait till spring? She's from, the queen is from a split they did in late summer. Ooh, two answers here. It could be from the brothers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes you can get a situation where you've got a colony that's a bit weak for whatever reason and finally it gets on its feet and then it does great. So you've got a bit of a choice of whether to intervene or not. Generally, if you're unsure and there is a, but you can see a laying queen, I'd leave it. But if, if you really want to get in and intervene, then um, that's also a, a, a uh, valid thing to do as well, in which case you might decide that the Queen's not doing a good enough job laying. As you said, you've benchmarked it on another hive which is doing great, plenty of brood, and you might want to take that Queen away and introduce uh, a new Queen that hopefully gets in there and lays a lot more eggs and then there's an explosion of, of new baby bees ready to go about all of the chores and foraging and so on. You, you could also consult your Queen supplier about that. One advantage of um, requeening now is that you won't be in a queue. You know, it gets uh, sometimes it's hard to get queens in the early spring, um, but you should consult your queen breeder, the one that's supplying the queens, and to say how how would that be if I did it now? How how should be accepted at this time of year, and um, how will she go over the winter? But if if the brood pattern's really low, maybe I'd be very very tempted to requeen, and it, it's amazing the difference it can make. Your genetics, the food that's available, and on top of diseases, they're your three main things you've got to what, be concerned about with bees. Fantastic, Stu. And just got to make sure, Stu, yeah. you're near um, Cedar's microphone uh, here, yeah. just for the sound. <laughs> they're sharing, then, you know, yeah. they're related, yeah. they're sharing the microphone. Yeah, yeah. it's here. It's here, the microphone. <laughs> oh, you can just speak to my shoulder. <laughs> To um, <laughs> this is this is, <laughs> uh, this is Marilyn from Bendigo in Victoria, here in Australia, and they've taken the flow, um, taken off the flow for winter. But two of them had quite a lot of ants in the back of them in their honey, and when they harvested, they got quite a few ants in the honey. So mm. they're trying to clean out the flow frames. Um, tips on that, and she, they have tried the cloth on the key. Is that the best sort of way to go? 
Oh, if, if there's ants up in there, then somehow <coughs> it's puzzling as to how they got in. Maybe their end cap was loose or... or um, Sorry, it? I'm supposed to be speaking close. Or, <laughs> but um, I have run a hose up these tubes sometimes too. I mean, the cloth on the keys is what I'll do if it's needed, but I have run a hose up because it's, the bees will have sealed the, the trough. You shouldn't get any leaking of water and a tiny bit of water in the hive won't matter if it's a warm day and um, so I've run I've run a hose up there if somehow you've got ants in there puzzling um, that's what you might have to do is run some water in get some water through it, it yeah yeah the the primary cause of ants getting in well in fact they shouldn't be able to get in at all unless this cap was removed for a little while in which case they go wow that's a really sweet warm home that is perfect and they will move into that area. So that could be the case, um, in which case getting them out is a bit annoying. But if you are going to run water into the hive, then um, then put the tube in when you do it. Reason is this is a leak back point here. You don't want a lot of water pouring into the hive if you can help it. So that little tongue goes into the bottom, just like when you're harvesting and that'll stop that. And But just swish it in, let it run out. Don't connect your hose to it, or of course it'll <laughs> flood in to the hive. Good point. So you just want to swish it in, let it swish out. And you can do that with warm water or even cold water, and that might flush those ants out that somehow got in there. If they got in there when the cap was in, then there might be a problem with your frame. Perhaps there's a piece of the frame missing um, from the manufacturing process and the ants are able to get in there. However, that's unlikely because... Yeah, the bees will seal all of that up. The, the bees only really, ha the ants only really have access to the outside sections. Bees will keep ants away from the inside surfaces. They're very good at that. So, um, right. yeah. It's a bit of a puzzle, yeah. but you can wash it out a bit more than just a cloth on a key. On the key. Yeah. And look, while you're there, see to that leak back point, which I must say is one of my favourite things. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but anyway, Ian's asking um, mm. basically on that question, he's got honey at the bottom of the flow, and is there a drain hole to clean out the honey? Yes, so, so. it's right there, but you, if you have a look here, you can see there's a tiny bit of build up, and what we'll do is we'll pull that out. That's probably not the best example because we harvested that, um, but you can see. There's a little gap there between the yellow piece and the what was a clear piece before the bees got to it. It looks like we've got it all misaligned, that the floor of the trough is not in proper alignment with the hole at the end. But actually that's all on purpose and that's what creates that gap, the leak, leak back gap. And you can see the bees' tongues licking up through that gap. It's lovely, you know, as the honey steadily flows, you know, the trough sort of self clean so the honey remains of honey will keep flowing back to this end if you've got the hive on the correct tilt and the bees will lick it up as it, as it comes back. If you have a look at this cap, you'll see there's little ridges on it. Now those little ridges, are, so there's a gap left when you put it back in for the last remaining bits of honey to drain back uh, into the hive for the bees to reuse. And the bees you'll see licking up the gap with that, that's designed to be about a bee tongue width and they can get their tongue up uh, beside this cap and to where their honey is. And if you have a look really close, you'll actually see that. Okay, okay, so we were a bit out on our key measurement. We've filled that jar. Uh, we only wanted one jar. So for those that are just tuning in, we just wanted one jar of honey, so we inserted the key just a small amount. So one sixth of the way in should be about one of these jars because there's six or seven of these per frame. But in this case, there's still a bit left over, which we will enjoy as well. So that cap goes back in. And away we go. Any more questions? Great. Um, so you know, this one's actually for you. It's someone um, that you met, Philip Alton. It's Phil from Starseed Gardens. You met back in the day before your launch oh, and great. bought two flow hives when they were in Byron and just Excellent. living back in Vancouver now. He's got a question, but customer support will answer that one for you, Philip, but I just wanted to shout it out to you. Hey, nice <laughs> one. <laughs> um, Matt's asking, had a tiny amount of honey below one frame. It tasted as what he thought was fermented. Can honey ferment while still in the hive? And if so, will it affect the bees? And what to do with the fermented honey? So, there's two, two 
things there. One is if honey is building up in that point, which um, we didn't quite finish off the answer to that last question, so thanks for following on with it. If honey's building up in this area, which you can see a little bit in there, sometimes quite a lot builds up, the bees don't do as good job of sealing the flow frame parts, and you get a bit of honey building up in that area. And if you're in a, a climate that's a bit humid, then the moisture content could get a bit too high. And once it gets above 20%, it's likely to ferment. And you could get fermented honey in that area. Now, if, if you taste the honey in that, when you go to harvest and it's fermented, then the best thing to do would be to give that a clean out, as we said earlier, by putting some cloth on here. Or if there's a lot of it, you could insert a tube and let it drain out for a little while and just discard that fermented honey. Don't let other bees um, uh, get to it though because you don't want to spread, spread pathogens from one hive to the next. Um, if you have a clean chop and you've harvested and the honey is fermented in the frames, that can happen sometimes, especially in a humid climate where the bees attempt to get the moisture content down around 18 percent but they don't do a great job of it they get a bit lazy and they just decide to put the cap on early and that <laughs> that by the way can happen for both flow frames and conventional frames that occasionally bees cap their honey and it really isn't what we call ripe and therefore the, it ferments in the frames it can yeah, as i said it can happen in flow frames or it can happen in conventional frames it's a general beekeeping thing but it is quite rare Typically what um, conventional beekeepers do at that point is they go through a pasteurisation process which they can easily recover fermented honey from. Um, but in our case we want to be eating raw honey with all the, the vitamins, and minerals, phytonutrients and enzymes in there. So the best thing I would say to do if you do have a nice big amount of fermented honey is make some honey mead, look up some recipes, have some fun with it um, and it can, can make a nice beverage like that. Now, still didn't quite finish answering that question about this point. Now, if the bees um, do wax up that point, bees will be bees, and even though we've designed a nice little gap there, they'll fill it with wax. And that will mean that leak back point won't work anymore. Honey will build up in that area and possibly ferment or go candy, depending on your climate. So the good thing to do is to clean that out. Now, you can use the end of your flow key, which you can see here, and you can just poke it in that area to clean that out, or you could use a twig or if you've got your tube handy, it's got a little piece that's made for, for dislodging that piece of wax. So every time you harvest, um, it happens for you, so you don't have to think about it, but um, the bees will be bees and sometimes block up that area. So it, sometimes just turning the cap around like this will break a, a wax seal that they've made and allow honey to drain back into the hive. But failing that, use your tube or use a twig or a key, unblock that area allow it to self-clean like it's uh, designed to? Great question. Yeah, great question. Um, Stu, this is for both you both and Cedar. It's from Chuck Rao, who's one of our flow ambassadors. Um, just wondering if either of you have had any experience with a long Langstroth hive. He's um, built one and he's going to put four flow frames in it and we'll be stalling a five frame nuke in a couple of days. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. I, um, I expected people to do a lot of experimentation with flow frames. In, in the beginning we thought we'd invent this thing, people would use it in all sorts of different types of hives. As it turned out, people just wanted it all complete in a hive and that's, uh, and that's what most people like. But I love to hear about people who are experimenting with them, putting them in observation hives, in, in top bar hives, in uh, long hives. And well, we actually got some long hive experiments at home. And I'm not sure why, but I haven't had that much success with it. Um, somehow, um, the... You this need long bees. Yeah, you need long bees. <laughs> <don't you>? long. <laughs> but it's probably d just, uh, you know, not trying hard enough and not having enough of them really to compare. But the hive we have got going horizontal, if you like, um, just isn't doing so well. It's not really uh, storing honey. Um, so... This configuration we know works very well, but do let us know your experience with your long hives as well. There's some advantages and there's some disadvantages. One advantage is the warmth from the brood box. They keep the hive about 35 degrees and that warmth then travels up and keeps your honey warm uh, as well, which means you get less candying issues. If you're going long, um, unless you've got it well insulated, you might get cooler flow frames on the edges. 
you might um, find that honey harvesting is slower. Um, but then again, you've got better access to your brood. Um, so there's pros and cons with everything beekeeping. Great. Um, just wondering the, um, how to fix the hive. What are your thoughts on if there's a moth infection in your flow frames? Okay, um, the, the, the only reason you'd get the wax moth in your flow frames is if the flow frames ha have been left out of the hive or your colony is so weak the bees can't look after the internal surfaces. So assuming you've left the flow frames out and they're covered in wax, wax moth will naturally go to wax because that's what they, they, they like and they're not a problem inside the hive, they're only a problem when you're uh, equipment is stored generally but correct me if you've got a different issue um, so all you need to do is brush off the the, the moths and their their cobwebs and um, the bees will do a good job at restoring the frame once it's back in the hive if it's really had vermin on it and it's not looking really good then give it a wash with hot water let it dry and then back in the hive, but otherwise the bees do a great job of restoring the surfaces inside. Yeah, and, and, and if it is the case that the wax moth have got hold in your hive, um, that's, that's fairly serious. Um, could mean that your hive's really on the decline. Maybe it's gone queenless and, there's, and you've, you're losing bee numbers, or maybe there's a sickness of some sort. Um, so best to get right in there, have a really good inspection and every frame that's not being used, both brood and flow frames, um, maybe re replace it or, or else even compress the whole thing down to one box. You know, if there's nothing really in the flow super, I would take it off and compress it down to one box and see what you can do about building the health of that colony up. Great. Um, Jim's calling in from Las Vegas and they're coming into frosts now wow. and just wondering yeah, <laughs> just wondering if should they remove the flow frames or not um, he's trying to find other people but he hasn't found anyone there to sort of talk about their experience with the flow hive through frosts just wondering what your thoughts are Las Vegas where in the US US but they're going into summer Oh, well. Just confusing. Anyway, but there is such a thing as Maybe wintering. he's not going in during a frost. <coughs> mm. It's me. I've misread it, you see. If, if there is just an ordinary frost, but you're, you're in the spring and it's warming up, you don't need to worry. The bees keep their hive warm and uh, there's no problem with frosts and so on. But if you're talking about overwintering when it's getting colder and colder, then you definitely should consult your locals as the best way to do that. But generally, it, in, it often involves... Um, harvesting completely the flow super or your normal super and compressing the hive down to one or two boxes and with one box still full of honey for them so you know it, there's a little bit in setting your hive up for over winter we won't go into that and certainly I'm not an expert on that because we live in the, this climate where um, you know it just doesn't get that cold yes um, just wondering and this is a question we get asked a lot through customer support as well how much honey um, out of a healthy flow hive would you get would the would, would it produce each year the answer like many things in beekeeping is it depends now <laughs> um, but I will give you a, a broad answer so in this area you can typically harvest all of these frames a couple of times a, a year and sometimes more but sometimes a lot less so it really does depend on the two major factors, which is the numbers of bees, so the strength of your colony, and also the abundance of nectar, whether there's a lot of nectar around for your bees. And pollen also, because they need the pollen and the nectar to have a healthy hive to raise their young, to build up in numbers. So if they don't have that forage, then they uh, won't be able to really store any honey at all. You can get situations where you have a drought, where there's not, uh, the, the rains didn't come, the flowers didn't flower, and your bees actually are consuming their stores. So bees are, are storing honey for times when there's no flowers. So that's their stores. So it's important to keep that in mind. If you're unsure, just harvest a bit and leave the rest for the bees. Like we're doing today, we're just harvesting a couple of jars and leaving the rest. However, if you see an abundance coming in, you're watching these windows, you're seeing it really filling. You have these other experiences where you harvest all the frames, two weeks later they're full again. 
and that's exciting <coughs> when that happens. So getting back to your question, if we harvested all of these frames um, twice in the season, it might be a, an average, you get a hundred of these jars, which is enough usually for a family that to keep up with a family. And <laughs> <laughs> often um, people find that they've got a lot of honey to share around, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, everyone loves honey, keeps your neighbours sweet, and uh, it's a good thing. <laughs> Look, just to go into that a little bit more, I mean, I've got three hives near my house at home. One of them is, is amazing at bringing in the honey. It builds up its stores very, very quickly, and the one exactly beside it, as as many bees, similar amount of bees and so on, in the hive, but it doesn't bring in nearly as much. So you might say, oh, I much prefer the one that brings in all of that honey. But there's other factors to consider as well. Which one's the most gentle? You know, maybe it's more important for you to have gentle bees and have that that as the priority rather than the most productive. And there's also the high, how hygienic they are. That's a beekeeper's term for how good are they at managing the pests and making sure they're disease free because that varies amongst colonies as well. So generally while it's tempting to select and, and go for a high honey production, there's other factors you should be considering as well when you are looking at your colonies. Great. Um, thanks Jude. Danny's got a question saying it's kind of past a beginner question, um, but do secondary swarms have mated queens? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, well, I, I think they can have either. Um, yeah, they can have either because a swarm can go with a virgin queen. So if anyone knows the answer to that question, stick it in the comments below. Yeah. We, um, it's a great thing having a really engaged audience. If you know the answer to somebody else's question, chip in. It's all about helping each other learn. and. Um, we're learning all the time. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, how long does a queen last in a hive? Well, she'll, the queen will last um, years and years and years. And finally, when her egg laying starts slowing up, the bees, the rest of the colony will um, basically kill her or throw her out. And, and before they've even done that, they will have raised some new queens. So the bees themselves, as a colony, are deciding how long their queen should last and it depends on her performance so she's not so much of an absolute monarch as you might think um, so generally for beekeepers uh, professionals will generally requeen every year because a new queen is very very productive will lay a lot of eggs and uh, they're, they're sure to have good genetics then amateur beekeepers tend to requeen every two years she will last three or four but by then your colony will be really slowing down and she can even last up to, to six years. And uh, towards the end of her life, she might either run out of sperm and start laying only drones. But hopefully the colony would have raised a new queen by then. But you can get into the situation where she, she, does, she only mates in the first two weeks of her life. And then from then on, she's relying on the sperm she collected from 30, 60, 100 drones. And, um, and uh, that can run out and when she can't fertilize an egg it turns into a male bee you end up with a whole hive full of drones males that don't do the dishes they don't do any chores <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the whole thing turns into a useless uh, share house <laughs> that collapses <laughs> they just order in pizza instead of going offline i've been like in a that. few of those over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh fantastic um, BD, you don't know who that is, is asking a question about the pest management tray and just wondering about like maintaining it and using it. Just noticed after a couple of weeks there was a bit of mould in it. Mold in it. They cleaned it out and then put the veggie oil back in. Is that kind of on track? That is. So, um, so it will get a bit manky down there. It's, uh, it is just the debris that's falling through from the hive. Moisture might come in from the front as well and um, it's pretty normal for it to get a bit grimy down there. Just get your hive tool, the, uh, the chisel end, the one that comes with our bee suits, um, and just scrape out the debris. Replenish the oil if you're using that to catch the beetles, or if you don't have a small hive beetle, then you won't need any oil in the tray. 
Um, some people might even choose not to run the tray in there at all, or perhaps they can run the tray upside down um, it's a, if, if they don't want to use it for actually storing oil to catch beetles. But, so a dry tray has the advantage of you you're starting to see what debris is coming down through the hive and if there are pests and things involved in it and if there's too much somehow you get to know but the oil has that advantage of drowning for us small hive beetles are a real problem I've seen moth larvae too the bees have just shoved it out of the hive down through the screened bottom and, and into the oil so uh, the oil has that advantage of, of killing off pests for you a um, little bit harder to tell um, what's going on in terms of what they're throwing out because of the oil anyway but uh, yeah I generally use oil because of our, our problem with beetles yep yep um, the new entrance reducer that's just come out with the flow hive 2 plus will it keep mice out so the um, correct me if I'm wrong uh, that the most common mice in the USA um, it will keep out it's designed to keep the mice out, but let me know how you go. There, there's two types of mice, the most common one, um, even the flow hive entrance, um, they don't generally come in because it, it's a narrower than a typical Langstroth hive. Um, but the entrance reducer is smaller, again, designed to, to make it um, easier for your colony to, to uh, keep things like mice and wasps and things away and potentially robber bees. Great. Melissa's um, coming in from New S in Sydney and just wondering when is it, when is it, when should you not inspect? <laughs> when is it too cold to inspect your hive? You can just about judge that from if it feels cold to you. I mean the best days to inspect are balmy warm days. Um, as soon as it's getting windy the bees are likely to be more disturbed and then if it's a cold wind as well. Um, if you would feel chilly in just, you know, say, one or, you know, a t-shirt and a shirt, um, perhaps it's a bit chilly for your bees. Having said that, sometimes it's more important to inspect and you've just got to do it. If you suspect American Towerbrood, for example, you've got to have a look um, and uh, you just try and choose the warmest time of the day. So, uh, yeah. If it is cold, just um, be mindful that uncapped uh, brood so the grubs down the cells are sensitive to the cold but cap brood not so much so if you've got a lot of uncapped brood on the frames just don't leave it out in the cold for too long or as small amount of time as possible if it is quite cold when you're inspecting we've got time for a couple more questions oh okay um, this one's coming from candy sue the blue who's just down the road from us here at cooper shoot just wondering how how do the bees cope with the wind um, saying that she gets even more wind than we get here at newry bar well, that's hard to believe. We get a lot yeah. of wind. <laughs> we get um, the, the wind up this slope here. It get, gets very strong. When you get those um, east coast lows here, typically we found when the wind would get to 80 kilometres an hour up this slope, it would blow the roof off on our classic hives. And that's why on, on this flow hive too, we put these, um, these uh, wing screws here to hold the roof on and that's working well these roofs don't get blown off even when you get those um, semi-cyclonic winds coming up up the face here now bees are very resourceful they can be out in the wind like this um, they would probably prefer it if they weren't but they they certainly can and and in other countries like up in, in north america you're going to get it very strong very cold winds they are a european honeybee they are built to survive the extremes. So you'll probably find it, it's not much of an issue. If you do have the option to place your hive where it's a bit more protected, they'll probably prefer that, but they will do fine in the wind as well. Right, and um, a couple of people saying, so what's the flavor of the honey today? I tasted the flavor and I got hit with the paperbark, the melaleuca that has been flowering recently. And I haven't tasted that flavor for a while. So it's great to, to taste it again. I have to admit, it's not my favorite flavor. I, I like all honeys and I do like the, the paper bark, but I don't like too much of it because it's almost a sickly sweet flavor. It's, it's like kind of like a, a, a burnt, 
uh, toffee, sickly, sweet flavour, and it's that really similar to the smell you get when you walk past a paperbark tree in blossom. So um, lots of people love it. For me, it's not my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> um, just someone asking about swarms, just wanting to speak about swarming, they keep hearing other beekeepers talking about it, um, watched, been watching our presentations and it doesn't seem to be so much of an issue um, there in California in the USA. It's a, it, swarming's another thing with, to do with genetics as well as the way you manage your bees and um, some beekeepers who live in a more rural area don't worry about it too much but if you live in an urban area swarms are a hassle and of course from a beekeeper's point of view if you half of your hive lee, leaves you've lost half your stock and they have to rep replenish it so um, the genetics is um, that's where you talk to your queen suppliers and, and find out if they've been selecting for minimum swarming and if you have, if your bees do come from, you caught a swarm or your friends caught a swarm for you, then there's that more likelihood that they're more, they'll be more likely to swarm themselves because they sort of came from a swarming stock. So there's the genetic side and then there's the inspecting. Now swarming is going to happen uh, as the bees build up their numbers in spring and as the nectar flow comes on they're going to be saying, Bute, it's a good time for us to split, you know, and, uh, well, half of us to split, <laughs> so to speak. And, um, and uh, so you've got to be inspecting pretty regularly in early spring. And probably, I mean, I, I, I might inspect, but really I'm splitting, getting ready to split the hives so that I'm doing swarm prevention in advance by splitting colonies in half or, or even in quarters. That's my favourite method is you come to springtime when you open the windows and you see the bees really building up, you know that there's a chance that they're going to swarm. So, you know, you can't be hanging around all day just waiting for your hive to swarm and then chase it around. I mean, it can be fun for, uh, for a little bit, but uh, um, you're better off just taking a split, get ahead of the curve. If you don't want another hive, somebody else surely will. So we've got plenty of videos on taking uh, splits. We've, we've shown you how to do it. Um, in one of these live uh, broadcasts as well with my sister. Um, we have um, also got in-depth training material at thebeekeeper.org which is a program we've put together. Experts around the world are contributing to that. It's a fundraiser as well for habitat regeneration and protection and people are really enjoying the high quality training material that's coming through there. It's really helping them fast track their knowledge and um, in the end, if, if, if we can uh, pass on our knowledge, that's what we need to do. So we're all able to, to look after our bees and become great beekeepers. Thank you very much for tuning in. We do have to cut it a little bit um, short today. Here's my sister who's um, just walked in from the background. She's got a, uh, a bee on her finger. She was also just... Um, just had her ear against the hive, then Trace, who's been asking the questions, had her ear against the hive. It was a, it was a, a, a nice sight a moment ago. I suspect you were listening to a queen. It wasn't a quacking, it was like a rumble. Wow. Like this really, we I've won't never, be able to I've, hear you very well unless, in, unless you speak at his oh, shoulder. It was like a rumble sound. I've never heard it before. But like with bees, there's something new every time. Yeah. But I just found that little bee and she was looking a bit bedraggled. She was stuck on the back of the hive. So I picked her up, got some honey and stuck it there and she slurped away happily. <laughs> <laughs> and then flew off. So. Slurped away. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> honey from that hive, right? Yes. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> I would have used sugar syrup, but didn't have any. <laughs> Um, yeah, so th th there is these interesting noises that the queens make. And, She's um, still making oh, 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 it. There they are. There She's they still are. making it. Give me the mic and see if we can hear it. Okay, we're going we're gonna to tape the mic to the hive, see if we can hear this interesting sound. Give us a thumbs up if you can hear an interesting uh, noise from the bees. Oh, it just stopped. <laughs> There's a lot of other background noise too. There is, the but it's like this soft rumble. A truck Those annoying birds always tweeting away. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you very much for tuning in. If you've got uh, questions you'd like us to answer, by all means put them in the comments below and we'll keep answering those. Also let us know what you'd like us to cover next week and hopefully we'll be back same time next week with something interesting to show you. With the idea that we um, help 